Praise God. Thank you, Lord. All the glory goes to the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, my wife and I are so excited to be back here at the Way World Outreach. What an amazing church you have. You guys are so blessed. And the staff, everybody, uh, the pastors are so wonderful here, but especially um, Pastor Marco. We are very blessed to know him. And um, he's a great man of God, and, and you are very blessed to have him as your pastor. And I'm sure you know that, but uh, again, we don't take this lightly being in his, in his pulpit. I'm very honored to be here. So thank you all for coming, and online, thank you for joining us. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. If most of us go on a vacation, we check out the sites, the hotels, the restaurants. We do some investigation. Yet most people do no investigation on where they're going to go after they die. They put a great deal of effort into a short vacation, but no effort into eternity. Well, I'm just here to share with you some information that will enable you to make an informed decision about your afterlife. Because if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're on the wrong road and you don't know it. And the wisest man that ever lived was King Solomon, except for Jesus. And he said in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So you're going to hear about the horrors of hell, and it's far worse than you can imagine. But the good news is no one has to go there. I'm going to show you that it's your own words that send you there, not God. He's trying to keep people out, but a person's words send them to hell. On November 23rd, 1998, I had an experience that changed my life. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe my experience. What matters is that you check out what the Bible has to say about hell and avoid it just the same. This was not a near-death experience. This was an out-of-body experience that's classified as a vision in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. So in a vision, Paul and John, they actually traveled to heaven in their spirit bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 44 talks about a natural body and a spirit body. Ezekiel traveled from Babylon to Jerusalem in Ezekiel chapter 8. And he experienced the sweetness of the food in his stomach. He wept, he conversed. So my point is, in your spirit body, the things experienced are just as real as they would be in your physical body. And this is not to compare my experience with any of the great men of the Bible. I'm just trying to give you a scriptural basis of how this can occur for a Christian. The only way a Christian can see hell is in a dream or vision. And I was a Christian for 28 years when this occurred. Uh, Job 7.14 says, You scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. So you can have a terrifying vision. Isaiah 21.2, He was given a grievous vision. And in Job 4.14, Eliphaz was given a vision that caused his bones to shake. So you can have a grievous, terrifying, bone-shaking vision. But one thing that was unique about this vision was God blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. He hid that fact from me. You say, where's that in the Bible? In Luke 24, 16, when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holding that they should not know him. John MacArthur's commentary and Matthew Henry's commentary say they were kept by God from recognizing him. So they, God hid it from their minds, and he hid it from my mind for a reason which I will get to and explain. And um, <clears throat> you might say, Bill, but why do I need to hear about hell? I'm a Christian. I'm not going there. Three quick reasons. Number one, when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be much more appreciative of your own salvation from what you were saved from. See, a lot of Christians today believe in a teaching called annihilationism, and that's a teaching that says you simply cease to exist if you deny Jesus. Well, that's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these should go into everlasting life and these should go into everlasting punishment. He used the word everlasting as the word aeonios. So just as heaven is everlasting, so is hell everlasting. You'll thank God you were saved from this horrible place. Number two, it'll cause us as Christians to walk more in the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 17 said, the fear of the Lord is to read his word daily and to obey his word daily that we have enough respect for Almighty God that we will obey Him. You know, and Jesus said in Mark 9, 47, if your eye offends thee, and the word offend means causes you to sin, He said, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than into hell fire. So He's warning us, if you're playing around with a sinful lifestyle, you're in danger of hell fire. So when you understand how severe hell is, you will not want to play around with sin. You're going to want to walk straight with God. 
And number three, it gives us Christians more of a passion for the lost, a desire to witness. You know, most Christians come to church and hear a message, and that's wonderful, but they go home and they never open up their mouth. Yet we are all called to share the gospel. But see, when you understand how severe it is, you'll think, man, I didn't know it was this bad. I had no idea. I cannot let my family or my friends go there. I've got to pray more diligently. See, now you won't just pray a nice, sweet, uh, quick prayer. You will maybe get on your knees and cry out to God and say, Oh, God, don't let my family go to hell, Lord. Send labors across their path that they will listen to. Give them a dream or a vision. Lord, please don't let my family go to hell. You'll be before God praying diligently when you understand how severe it is. In 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11, Paul said, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, even though that scripture is talking about the judgment seat, the reward seat for Christians, most commentaries point out that he was also talking about judgment and hell in general. When you understand judgment and hell in general, you will be more persuasive with men. You will take more effort. And each day you'll say, Lord, I'm available. Use me today. Put me in front of somebody today. I want to share your word with somebody today. And that's the, that's the heart God wants us to have. It's not just Pastor Marco's job or the pastor's. All of us are called to preach the gospel. Now, Charles Spurgeon said 90% of our witness is through our life example. Do we show up on time? Do we keep our word to our own hurt? Do we show love to people that are ugly to us? Are we quick to forgive? Those are the reasons people observe us. They watch and see how we respond. And so most of our witness is through our just life example. But also we are to take the opportunity to open our mouths and share the truth with people. God's entrusted us with his precious word. So that's what I want to instill in you all, that you get a hold of God's heart and want to do all he can, use your talent for God to win souls. Amen? All right. We went to a prayer meeting. We attended every Sunday night. Nothing unusual about the night. At this point of my life, I had never studied the topic of hell. I've never gone to dark movies. I've never drank. I've never taken drugs. And I had never had a vision before. And we came home like any other normal night, went to bed. I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. And I was walking through our living room. And suddenly something grabbed me and pulled me out of my body. And I saw my body fall to the floor and I started tumbling down this long tunnel and it was getting hotter and hotter. And I passed through this open cavern-like area and I landed on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell. Rough hewn stone walls, bars, filthy stinking prison, but like a dungeon. But Isaiah 24, 22 says, And they shall be gathered get together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17, 16, They shall go down to the bars of the pit. Jonah 2, 6, The earth with her bars was about me forever. And uh, so the Tyndale, the New International Commentary, points out that Jonah, he was actually at the gates of hell and that, that it was literal bars and gates. Well, that's where I first found myself, face down on the floor. And the first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was like a blast furnace. How could it be alive in this place? My reaction was I wanted to get up and run out of this prison cell. But I noticed I had no physical strength in my body. But see, Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Now, if you ever had the flu and you felt weak, it's a thousand times worse than that. Any movement takes tremendous effort in hell. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, In him we live and move and have our being. Even movement comes from God. It's not automatic. I looked up and I saw these two creatures in the cell. They were demons, uh, reptilous in appearance, bumps and scales all over their body, a uh, huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws about a foot long. And these particular two were actually about 12 or 13 feet tall. That's not an exaggeration. There's scripture for that too, but I'll keep moving. Uh, and they were pacing in the cell like a vicious, caged animal. They had the most ferocious demeanor about them, and they were blaspheming and cursing God. But we know blasphemy comes from the demonic realm. Revelation 13, 6, James 2, 7, some others. Then they directed that hatred they had for God, they directed it towards me. I wonder why. What have I done to them? But the one demon picked me up, threw me into the wall of this prison cell, like I weighed the weight of a water glass. Tremendous strength demons have, and you have none. I hit the walls, and I've... 
I felt as if every bone in my body had broken. I wondered, how could I be alive through this? I should be dead. Now, maybe a spirit doesn't have bones, but it felt that way. But I have to explain one thing. I understood most of the pain was being blocked. But the Lord on the way back explained to me that he blocked most of the pain I normally would have felt from that. But he allowed me to feel a small amount of it so I could relate to people that it's not metaphorical. It's not a state of the mind. It's real, literal pain you're going to feel in hell. Thank God he blocked it, most of it. Then the other demon grabbed me from behind and picked me up and dug its claws in my chest and just tore the flesh open. I, I couldn't believe this is happening. How, how am I living through this? I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember Luke 16, the rich man Jesus talked about in hell. He had eyes to lift. He had a mouth to speak. He had a tongue. He wanted a drop of water. You have a body, but it withstands these torments. But something else I noticed, there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. It was just all dry. But Leviticus 17, 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They have an extreme hatred for mankind. But see, Psalms 103, 17 says, the mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell, so you don't derive the benefit of mercy. About this time, it went dark. Now, I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see, but he withdrew his light, and then it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. I mean, you cannot see the hand in front of your face. But Lamentations 3, 6 says, He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever. But it wasn't just dark. You could actually feel the darkness. And that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. It, it's so dark and so evil, it just seems to penetrate through every cell in your body. Now, I was taken out of this prison cell and placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. This pit was a, like a hole in the ground about a mile across in diameter. Huge hole filled with fire. And it was not metaphorical fire, it was real, literal fire. I felt the heat, I saw the flames, but more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Psalms 11:6 6 says, upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Isaiah 33, 12 says, the people shall be as the burnings of lime. They shall be as thorns cut up and thrown into the fire and burned. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Many scriptures about the fires of hell but, and people burning, but this is where I could first see people. I could see through the flames. It's so dark, it consumes the light. The light doesn't travel. Like here on the earth, a pit a mile across would produce a lot of light. In hell, it doesn't. It's like sucking in the light. But I could see through it and just along the edges. And there were literally thousands of people in this huge pit. I could only see their, uh, the outlines of people. They, they look like skeletons. You cannot distinguish a man from a woman. It looked like flesh hanging off their bones. And they were screaming, and the screams were so deafening. You want to escape that, but you can't. You have to endure the screams for all eternity. But Isaiah 57, 20 says, The wicked are like the troubled. Uh, I mean, 57, 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no peace of mine, no peace of any kind. But Isaiah 32, 18 says, My people dwell in a quiet resting place. You're not his people. So you don't derive the benefit of quiet. I wanted to... Um, let my wife know where I was at. I wanted to just say goodbye, but I had the understanding I'll never have that opportunity. See, Job 7, 9 says, he that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. You understand you're not ever going to get out. And you don't realize what a tormenting thought that is to have no finality with your family. I could never see her again. I could never tell her I love her. I could never hold her. And Again, you don't realize to not have any finality, to not be able to say goodbye. There's something at least satisfying about saying goodbye. And see, death does not mean seeks to exist. Death means separation from God. You still exist. You're just down deep in the earth. And I wanted to talk to a person, just anybody. But those people in the pit, they're all kept at a distance from each other. So you never have any conversation again with anybody. You're completely isolated and by yourself for all eternity. 
You have no purpose, no destiny. It's just a complete useless wasting away. Ecclesiastes 9, 10 says, there is no work, no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. You have no identity. Ecclesiastes 6, 4 says, your name is covered in darkness. And you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88, 12, Isaiah 26, 14, Deuteronomy 32, 26, Psalms 109, 15, all explain that you're forgotten. That's an awful thing. You know that up on the earth, no one's given you a thought. I mean, do you think about people in hell now? We don't, right? The stench in hell is the most foul, putrid, disgusting odors, worse than any open sewer. And remember, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9, 25. Demons have a disgusting, foul, decaying odor to them, but also the smell of burning flesh. And then on top of that, you're breathing this, uh, sulfur. And if you go to Hawaii to the volcano, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity coming up from this volcano, it's called sulfur dioxide. And it's toxic. It will kill you to breathe it. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And the word brimstone is mentioned 14 times in the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. But it's even worse than that because there's not enough air to breathe. So you have to fight for even the tiniest bit of oxygen. And maybe only an asthma patient can relate to this. But this is how you breathe in hell. It's like... <coughs> Well, that was as much air as you could get. At any moment, you feel like you're going to suffocate. That's not enough air. But see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, The Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. God is very specific with his word. You need to sleep in hell. Like here, we need sleep. If you ever stayed up for, say, two nights, don't go to sleep for two nights. You can't function after two days, right? You're pretty much a wreck. Well, in hell, you need to sleep also, but you never get to go to sleep. So it gets progressively worse. See, Revelation 14, 10 and 11 says, And they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, that primarily means no rest in the torment, but no rest of any kind. Because Isaiah 57, 20 said, The wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the sea is always moving, can't rest. Well, you can never rest in hell. But see, rest is a blessing from God. Psalms 127.2 says, The Lord gives his beloved sleep. You're not his beloved. So you don't derive the benefit of sleep. I was standing next to this big pit of fire, and I could see along the edges, there were individual pits of fire, and some people were in the, their own individual pit, others were in the big pit, and some were in prison cells. I'm just telling you what I saw. You know, Isaiah 30, 33 says, hell is deep and large. It's a big place. I only saw a little, I'm just telling you what I saw. But the flames would raise up uh, and on the people and burn their flesh off. And the screams were so loud. And I noticed I was standing beneath cavern walls that were ascending upward. And all along the cavern walls were demons. Some were only two and three feet tall. Some were 12 and 13 feet tall. But they were all twisted, deformed, and grotesque hideous looking creatures and they have no symmetry to their bodies one leg is bigger than the other one arm shorter than the other uh, twisted and deformed and there were snakes crawling all over everything and I was standing on a bed of maggots with solid maggots crawling all over everything and everybody but Isaiah 14 11 says where the maggot will be spread under thee and the worm will cover thee it uses the word maggot look it up in the original and I never knew this, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, after the maggots consume the flesh, the maggots die. I didn't know that. They die after they consume the flesh. That's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not. And he used the word maggot. So the, the, doesn't, the flesh is never fully consumed in hell. So as Job 24, 20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee. Is that disgusting enough? You're hungry. You never get to eat. You have the feeling of hunger for all eternity. Thirst, remember the rich man Jesus talked about in hell in Luke 16? It's a true story about him, and he wanted a drop of water. Now, if I was to give you one drop, just one drop, that wouldn't suffice, would it? You wouldn't value one drop. But in hell you would. You would do anything for that one drop that you'll never get. Just think that rich man still longing for that drop of water. That was 2,000 years ago. 
the fear that you experience in hell. We're all comfortable here now. I'm going to share with you an experience I had so you can understand the fear that you're enduring for all eternity. Now, maybe some of you can relate to something you've been through. Maybe you were just even in a car accident, the moment before the impact, <gasps> the fear that jumps up in your throat, right? Or maybe you were held up at gunpoint, maybe you're in the war and you saw some horrible things. Well, I'll share with you an experience I had so you can relate and understand this fear that you have to also endure. I used to surf a lot when I was a teenager. I was 17 years old, surfing off Cocoa Beach, Florida. And it was a really big day that day. And when it's big in Florida, off Cocoa, it breaks out about a quarter mile out. So we were about a quarter mile off the beach, about 100 guys out having a great time. And suddenly the guy next to me got his leg torn off. A shark grabbed him, ripped his leg off, blood all over the water. Then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of sharks came. So us guys got up on our knees trying to get our legs out of the water. I was on a nine-foot board at the time, and a shark passed by my board. He opened his mouth. I saw their teeth. They're huge. And he passed by. He's longer than my board. And, I, I mean, it's terrifying to be that close to a shark. I, I, you have no idea unless you're there. Anyway, the shark came back, bit my board in half. Now I'm swimming in the water. My buddy's knocked off his board. And he says, Bill, I guess we're dead. And sharks banging into our legs all around us. And then this tiger shark came by, grabbed my leg, and yanked me down in the water. Suddenly, I went down in a flash. Now, you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment. Uh, even though you haven't been through it, you can at least imagine it, right? That fear that I felt at that moment paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. It wouldn't even register in hell. But see, Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, You cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. You're consumed with this terror for all eternity. This, this doesn't go away. That's just one of the things you're experiencing besides the darkness and the torment and the demons and the burning, the heat and hunger, all these things you're enduring. But a miracle happened that day. Not only did the shark open its mouth and let me go, but I didn't have a mark in my leg. That's impossible. If you know anything about tiger sharks, they have really razor-like teeth. My leg should have been shredded, but God was protecting me. Praise God. And I was not a Christian then, but I got saved immediately after that. So I did. I've been serving God ever since, and God has been so good to me. He's given me a beautiful wife. I married way over my head, you know, and uh, He's blessed me all these years. So we serve a good and a loving God. Amen? That's right. I want to take a minute and give you some scripture about being tormented in hell. Okay, I know I've been giving you scripture, but that's what's important for you to believe. It doesn't matter if you believe my experience. I'm not here to convince you to believe me. I am just a signpost to point you to the scriptures and believe those so you can avoid hell, okay? Some people say, Bill, aren't you exaggerating hell? Come on, demons, tormenting, and all that's an exaggeration. No, that's the Bible. So can you bear with me for two minutes while I give you some scripture? All right. Matthew 18, 34 mentions being delivered to the tormentors. Luke 12, 47 says you'll be beaten with many stripes or beaten with few. Who's doing the beating? Psalms 50, verse 22, you that forget God, you'll be torn in pieces. Matthew 24, 51, I will cut him in pieces and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Psalms 116:3. the pains of Sheol have gotten hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Amos 5, 18 and 19. For what good is the day of the Lord to you, judgment day? It'll be darkness. And as a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Job 33, 22. His soul draws near to the pit and his life to the destroyers. Psalms 141, 7. Their bones are scattered at Sheol's mouth. Psalms 49, 14. Their beauty shall consume away in Sheol from their dwelling. Psalms 32, 10, many sorrow shall be to the wicked. Psalm 78, 49, I will cast my wrath upon them by sending evil angels among them. Deuteronomy 32, 22, for a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn into the lowest hell. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with poison of serpents of the dust. 
Matthew 22, 13, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. John 15, 6, if a man abides not in me, just as men gather branches that are withered, they are thrown into the fire and are burned. Luke 12, 4 and 5, don't fear him who's after he's killed the body as no more he can do. Rather, fear him after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Mark 9, 43, if your hand or foot or eye offend thee, cut them off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than in the hell of fire, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Matthew 18, 8, 9, cast them in everlasting fire, uh, into hell of fire. Matthew 23, 33, Jesus said, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? And one more verse, Psalm 74, 20 says, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. The word cruelty, look it up in the Strong's Concordance, number 2555, it's a Hebrew word, it's the word Hamas. The terrorist group Hamas? Well, the word Hamas means ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. So for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. Well, that's what you're experiencing in hell. You say, Bill, why would God make such a horrible place? Well, Jesus said why. In Matthew 25, 41, he said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for man to go to this place, but he used the word prepared. That's the same word he used in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven or make ready. So he prepared heaven for us, hell for the devil. So what he did in the preparation was, you see, James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. So all the good we enjoy in life, the fresh air, sunshine, fellowship, drinking, eating, sleeping, all the good comes from God. It's not automatic. So what he did in the preparation was, he simply withdrew his attributes or his goodness. See, hell is dark because 1 John 1.5 said, God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1.4 said, God is life. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4, 16 said, God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 says, the mercy of the Lord's in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said, it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11, 11 says, water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9, 6 says, he is the Prince of Peace. So you see, if God removes himself from this situation, all the good goes with him. You can't separate the two. You can't have the good without God. Can you see that? So if you're a person in life here that says, I don't want anything to do with God. Well, fine. There's a place prepared. There's nothing to do with Him. Your choice. Right? Now, other than one thing, the fire in hell does represent God's wrath. All through the Scripture, it says He will pour out His wrath on sin on the people in hell in the form of fire. But God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross so we wouldn't have to take that wrath. So you can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. Your choice. As I was looking at all this horror, demons shoving people back in the pit, people burning, screaming, something began uh, raising me up in this tunnel, this ascending, the, the cavern walls that were around me. I started ascending up, and it got so dark. I mean, you could not see anything. And I could hear the screams of all the people and the demons and so forth. And then suddenly in this pitch black darkness, this bright light appeared. Now, I knew immediately who it was. There was no doubt in my mind when Jesus shows up, there's no question about who he is. Now, I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a bright, pure light. It was like no light I had ever seen, just pure, holy light. And um, I, just, I just said, Jesus. And he answered two words. He said, I am. That's all he said. I went out. I went out. I don't know if I died, passed out. I can only explain that through Revelation 1.16. When John saw him, he said, his countenance was bright as a sun, and I fell at his feet as one dead. Well, that's what happened to me. I was at his feet, but he touched me. And when I came to, it hit me so strongly, even though I had been a Christian for 28 years at that point, that if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that place for all eternity. I was so grateful.
for what Jesus did, that he went to the cross for me. The king of the universe gave his life for me to keep me out of hell and take me to heaven. I just wanted to worship him. I didn't want to ask him a question. I just said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking me to heaven. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. That's true. That's all you want to do is thank him. But after a time, thoughts started coming to my mind, and he would answer my thoughts. I didn't want to ask him a question, but he answered my thoughts. Psalms 139.2 says he answers our thoughts afar off. I thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. That statement surprised me. I thought, wait a minute, all Christians believe in hell. But we have found out since many Christians believe in annihilationism or universalism. That's a teaching that says everybody gets saved. Or soul sleep, you just go to sleep. There's many false teachings out there that Christians actually believe. So again, he wanted me to point people to the scriptures. Check them out. It's, the Bible's full of scripture. Jesus talked about hell in 46 different verses. And there's 150 verses in the Bible about hell. So it's very clear. I thought, Lord, why did those demons hate me so much? He said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. Remember, Jesus said in John 15, 18, they hated me before they hated you. See, demons hate God, but they can't hurt God, but they can hurt his creation. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So the destruction, the evil, the sickness, disease, poverty, all that comes from the demonic realm. It's not from God. We serve a good God that came to give us life more abundantly, right? We serve a good God. Praise the Lord for that. I said, Lord, why didn't I know you? He said, because if you would have known me, you would have had hope. See, I was there as, as a Christian, but I didn't know I was a Christian. And if I was there as a Christian, I would have known. I was, but I didn't know it. I would have known, praise God, he's getting me out of here. I would have known that, right? Well, he wanted me to experience what they feel, hopelessness. See, Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They have no hope for him because it's too late. And we don't know what it's like in life here to be hopeless. Because even if your situation is so painful, you're in dire pain, you can always die to escape the pain. But in hell, you can't. You can never get out. I just want that to sink in for a moment that you will never, ever, a hundred million years go by, it's still day one. Now you see why this decision is so important. I said, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit's. I said, okay. I said yes, sir, I'll go. But I have to admit, I complained. I witnessed to everybody when the, after this happened, but I didn't share this experience. I didn't want to. My best friend said, would you come to my house and share it at my Bible study? I said, no way. But he talked me into it after three months. I went reluctantly. Well, it spread from there. So for the next seven years, my wife and I began getting invited all over the country. There was no book then. And so we paid our own way. We never took one penny from anybody for seven years. Then after that, the publisher came to me and asked me to write the book. So it's not something I wanted to self-promote. But I was happy to write the book because it could place in there all the scriptures to do with hell. But I complained to the Lord. I said, Lord, I feel uncomfortable sharing this. I'm conservative. I don't want to be identified with someone that says they've been to hell. And he said, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. Mm. I had to repent. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, now it doesn't matter if I feel uncomfortable. If one person can come to the light of the scripture and avoid this horrible place, it's worth any uncomfortableness I would ever feel. Amen. But you know what? God's given us all a job to do, and there are no big shots with God. We all need each other. It's a team effort to win souls. So, and God's given you a talent I don't have. So I encourage you, whatever ability and talent God's given you, just seek him with all your heart and do whatever he's called you to do because we do not have a lot of time. We are truly in the last of the last days. But what we do for him, 
he will count it for all eternity. He'll remember what we do for him. So that's what's important. It gives us a better overall eternal perspective on what's really important is to serve God. We went above the earth, we came out of this tunnel, and we were in a whirlwind tunnel that extended above the earth. There's scripture for this too, but I got to keep moving. I'm getting close to out of time. But people were falling back down this whirlwind tunnel that we just came out of. People that died on the earth that didn't know Jesus were falling one after another after another back down into hell. And the Lord allowed me to feel just the peace of his heart, the anguish he feels for his soul falling into hell. And I couldn't stand it. I, I, I said, Lord, stop. I, I can't feel the the pain you feel for a person going to hell. You know, Ephesians 3.19 says his love passes knowledge. He loves us far more than we are able to love our loved ones. And he wanted me to remember a piece of his heart so I would have that heart to go and share with people. You know, there's people that don't maybe believe this, but, you know, God loves everybody. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He's trying to keep people out of hell. You know, you might say, but how can this loving God allow or send a good person to hell? Well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. I'll get to that in a minute. But, you know, if you're going to go by the standard of good, you might be pretty good and think, I'm pretty good. I should go to heaven. Well, compared to your standard, maybe you are good, but not compared to God's standard. James 2.10 says, if we offend his law in one point, we're guilty of all. And Revelation 21.8 says, all liars shall have the part in the lake of fire. If we lie just one time. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, no thief will inherit heaven if, that, if we just steal one thing. If we have one lustful thought, Jesus said that's the same as committing adultery, and no adulterer will inherit heaven. And that's just three of the Ten Commandments. So if we're going to be judged by that standard of good, would we be guilty or innocent? We'd all be guilty. There's even a scripture in Proverbs 24, 9 that says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin. If we have one foolish thought our entire life, that would exclude us from heaven. Man, that's a high standard, isn't it? So none of us can stand up to that standard and say, hey, I'm pretty good, let me into heaven. He's going to say, no, not, not according to my standard. Matter of fact, Job 15, 16 says, man is so filthy, he drinks iniquity like water. Thank God it's not based on being good, but on a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? That's right. But you might not be convinced yet. You might be like a radio talk show host I was on with. They said, he doesn't like Christians. Watch your back with this guy. I went on the air and he says, okay, I submit to you, Christian, that you, um, your God is unreasonable because he doesn't consider my viewpoint. My viewpoint is just as valid as your Christian viewpoint, and I'm a good person. I should be let into heaven. So what do you got to say for yourself, Christian? What do you say? You're on the air, live. Well, God gave me an analogy, thank God. I said, okay, you think you're a good person, you should be let into heaven. I said, say you went and found the most expensive home in the country, you knocked on their door, and you said, uh, excuse me, but I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? No, right? You don't know them. You have no relationship with them. I said, but you, you go through your whole life. You have nothing to do with God. You deny Jesus is the Son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of your life, you have the nerve to come knock on his door, demand to live there because you're a good person. What does good have to do with it? You don't know him. You don't know him. You have no relationship with him. Why should he let you into his house? See, God offered to be your father throughout your whole life. I said, but you pushed him away. You said, no, I don't want you. See, God is your creator. He's not your father until you invited Jesus as your savior. Then he becomes your father. Galatians 3.26, John 1.12, John 8.44, Romans 9, 7 and 8, John 17.9, all explain, he's your creator, he's not your father, to you invite him in. So it's unreasonable to expect to live with someone's house that you don't even know. He says, well, you Christians are narrow-minded. You think you're the only ones that's right. He says, I think all roads lead to heaven. That's what I think. I said, well, let me give you another analogy. Okay, you think all roads lead to heaven and we're narrow-minded. He goes, that's right. And I go, say you invited me over to dinner to your home. And you said, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you'll come to my house but that's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I'm gonna go north on 95. I'm gonna get off at MacArthur Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. Well, you're gonna tell me, Bill, you're not gonna to get to my house. I'm trying to give you clear directions. The same thing, God gives us clear directions to his house. <laughs> I think God knows where he lives. 
All we have to do is follow his clear directions, we will get there. That's not narrow-minded, that's specific. He's given us specific, clear directions on how to get there. He's not trying to keep people out. You know, my neighbor, he was a Marine, a tough Marine. He was an atheist. He never wanted to hear about God. He laughed and mocked God all his life. And one day I found out he was in a hospital. He had some disease. And so my wife and I went to see him. And this is a tough guy, strong, but never would listen to anything to do with the Bible. But when we got there, he was weeping. And he said, Bill, I almost died last night. And he said, I was slipping out of my body, and I was going down a long, dark tunnel. And he goes, I've never been scared of anything. But he said, I was terrified, terrified. What do I do to stay out of that place? I know I was heading for the wrong place. I said, yeah, Chuck, you were. You, you were heading to hell. And he goes, how do I stay out? And so we led him to the Lord. He genuinely accepted the Lord, wept. We've said the sinner's prayer, repented, so forth. But my point is, all his life he mocked God. But now he didn't even get to hell. He just had a glimpse of on the way to hell. And that terrified him. That's why I'm trying to get across to you. You don't want to see this place. Because one second after you die, it'll be too late. You will not get out. And this decision is so important. People slough it off and they think, well, I can think about it later. No, you might not have later. We were at a church meeting and the uh, pastor's nephew brought his best friend. He was 23 years old. And he listened to me, sat in the front row, listened to the whole thing. And at the end, he says, I don't believe you, Bill Weiss. I don't believe the Bible at all. And his friend said, look, you're my best friend. I want you to go to heaven with me when we die. You're my buddy. And he goes, I don't want to hear anything about this Bible stuff. It's nonsense. So he left, they went to breakfast the next day. This is a true story. Went to breakfast and he tried to talk to him again. He said, look, you're my best friend. I want you to go to heaven. He goes, I don't want to hear it. I'm not interested. I think it's rubbish. He got up from the breakfast table, got in his car. Five minutes later, his car hit a brick wall and he died. Now, if he didn't change in that last five minutes, his friend knew he's in hell for all eternity. And he had the opportunity right then just like the other thief on the cross. The one was wise, received Jesus. The other one was foolish. And now he's in hell for all eternity thinking, I had the opportunity and I turned it down. I was hanging next to the Savior of the world. Can you imagine that frustration? This is the clear direction to heaven. John 3.36 says, He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he that believes not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You have to know the Son. How do you do that? Just two verses. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, Unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. What does repent mean? That means to have a humble heart and admit, man, I'm a sinner, but I don't want to sin anymore. I want to turn away from sin. I want to follow Jesus. See, it's not enough to mentally assent to the fact and say, yeah, I believe Jesus is God. I believe that. And just go do your own thing, live your own life. That's not a really repentive heart. It's a turning away from sin and agreeing to follow Jesus. That's what it is. And then Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised from the dead, we shall be saved. We have to believe in our own heart and confess him with our own mouth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You want to live at his house? You do it his way. There's only one way. Amen. One way. But you, you might say, Bill, I just don't believe that. Well, then I have a verse for you. Revelation 21, 8 says, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. So there's the warning. And this is a message of love because he's given you the warning. He's telling you, if you don't believe Jesus is the only way and repent of your sins, you will end up in the lake of fire. That's why you can see why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you because you said, I don't believe Jesus is the only way. With your own mouth, you condemn yourself to hell. Because he loves you, he gave you that free will to choose. He will not force you into anything. But Revelation 20, 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God actually has a book. 
and he's going to look to see if our names are in his book. And you do not want to hear him say, your name's not here because you chose to push me away. It was your choice. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you, do you know if your name is written in his book? You have to be certain of this one. Again, please don't take a chance with your soul. Whether you believe it or not, your soul is eternal because we're all made in God's image. There is only heaven and hell, and heaven is not our default destination. There needs to be a purposeful act on our part. But you can have assurance today that your name is in his book. You can know that today. Or you might be saying, you know, Bill, I've been living compromised. I haven't gotten my life right, but I've got to get things straightened out with God. I need to get right with God. Today's the day for you also. So I'm going to ask you at the count of three, for everybody that wants to know that your name is in his book or you're willing to change your ways and come back to God, get things right with him, I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand at the count of three. One, two, three. Okay, raise your hand. Raise your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for honesty. Look, you want to make sure God sees that hand because he said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. You want to make sure he's writing your name in his book. So I'm going to ask you all, everybody stand to their feet. I'm going to invite each one of you that raised your hand, come down here to the front and give us the privilege of praying for you. Would you make your way down? I know it takes guts to get out of your seat. But it shows God you mean business. You're not doing this half-heartedly. You're not just slipping up your hand. No, you're committing your life to Him. If you're willing to do that, make your way down to the front. We're going to pray for you. No reason to be embarrassed. Most of us have done this. It says all of heaven celebrates over just one. And don't let the devil lie to you and say, I've got to clean myself up first. No, you don't. You just come as you are. God will clean you up. That's right. Keep coming. Look, I want to do one more thing. I don't want one person in here to have to go to hell. I'm telling you, you don't want to go there, not for five seconds. So all the people that you people that are standing, not you that came forward, but everybody that's standing in your seat, if you died today and you're positive you would go to heaven, and you can be as a Christian, you can be positive. If you're positive, I'm going to ask you to sit down. If you're positive, sit down. If you're not, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm just trying to get you to think. Think, this is a really important decision. Your soul is the most important thing you possess. So just take another minute and think about this. You're welcome to come forward and join us, but God is not gonna drag you to heaven. That's your choice. Look, if you were standing, if you were standing, I respect you. I respect that, that you took that stand. But please think about this decision. The devil's trying to lie to you and tell you, ah, oh, think about it later. Who knows what it's like? Man, I, I just want to party with my friends. And He's a liar, and he wants to win your soul, take you to hell. Look, you got another minute. Another minute we're going to give you. If you want to come forward, join us. 
And, and you don't give up anything when you come to God. You only gain when you come to God. Why would anybody take a chance with their soul? Why would you say, I don't believe Jesus. I believe he was a liar. That's what you'd have to say, that Jesus is lying. He's not lying. He's telling you the truth. He loves you. We're just going to wait another minute, and we're going to pray. Anybody else, last remaining, come forward. This is your opportunity. All right. We're going to pray. And all you people that came forward, I'm going to ask you, you're going to say this, repeat this prayer after me, and we can all say this together, but I'm going to ask you all to lift up your hands. It's just like an act of surrender. You're saying, God, I give you my life. You know, it takes effort, but you're surrendering your life and saying, here I am. You want your name in his book, right? This is it. All right. You guys ready? We're going to say this prayer. Let's all say this. Dear God in heaven, I know that I've sinned and I cannot save myself. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me, that he was crucified, died and was buried, but rose again and lives forevermore. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry. I repent. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You are the Son of God. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for taking me to heaven. I ask you to fill me with your spirit, and I'll serve you all the days of my life. And I now confess I'm a born-again Christian going to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God.